Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we're going to look at additional specific specific fraud risk areas. We're going to look at inventory, accounts payable, fixed asset, and payroll expense. Now, bear in mind, this is not a fraud case. So this is not a fraud, not case. I meant to say a fraud course. This is an audit course. So we do talk about fraud, but not that much in depth. Now, eventually, I may have a fraud fraud course on YouTube but I teach fraud every once in a while, I may or may not. I just wanna make sure you're aware that this is not enough to learn about fraud because myself, I am a CFE certified fraud examiner and I know a lot about fraud, but this is not a fraud course. So keep that in mind. So this series is part of our previous uh, series, which is fraud auditing. In the prior session, we looked at fraud risk areas that relates to sales and account receivable. Now we're gonna be looking at inventory, accounts payable and other accounts. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we're going to look at is inventory. Inventory is also an important figure because inventory, remember, factors into cost of goods sold and cost of goods sold is related to sales. So in a sense, we talked about it briefly in the prior session. So inventory fraud risk, what happened is we have fictitious inventory. Okay, fictitious inventory is what? We claim that we have more inventory than what we have. Why? If you remember from your financial accounting 101, here's the formula. If you take beginning inventory plus purchases those two figures together they give you a number called goods available for sale let's use some figures let's assume inventory we started the inventory with 500,000 we purchased 7.5 million of inventory so we had goods available for sale of 8 million 8 million. Now what happened to goods available for sale? Goods available for sale would either go to ending inventory. It's going to end up in ending inventory. Simply put, we don't sell it. Ending inventory. Or it goes to cost of goods sold. So maybe ending inventory, we still have a million. Okay, of the 8 million, we still have a million. It means cost of goods sold. It means we sold 7 million worth of inventory. Now bear in mind, if you claim to have rather than 1 million, if you claim to have 2 million of inventory, your cost of goods sold becomes 6 million. So notice it's a zero sum game. When one goes up, the other one goes down. When one goes down, the other one goes up. So it's a zero sum game. Or if this goes down, this will go up. Okay, it's like a seesaw. So basically, inventory and cost of goods sold is like a seesaw. So if we have invent ending inventory here and cost of goods sold here, if we overstate ending inventory, I'm sorry, let's start with ending inventory. If we overstate ending inventory, cost of goods sold goes down. Okay, if we have overstate, or if we understate, basically, if we understate inventory, cost of goods sold will go up. So, companies, what they do, if they want to inflate their uh, profit, they will claim that they have more inventory. If they claim more inventory, cost of goods sold will go down. So this is the idea of inflating ending inventory. That's the purpose of it. And the classic case for this is Crazy Eddie. And we would look at their financial statement just to show you how analytical procedures will help you pick up fraud that comes to ending inventory. Okay. Auditors are required to verify the existence of physical inventory, but the audit test on test on a sample basis. Now we're going to look at in the inventory cycle later on at, when it comes to auditing. And we're going to look at this a little bit more in details. If inventory is stored in several locations, it's, it's relatively easy for the client to move inventory to the sample testing site. And this is basically some of the crazy editing things that they used to do. Transport inventory from where, one warehouse to the other, um, fooling the investor, fooling the auditor into thinking they have more inventory. Warning signs of inventory, usually analytical procedure is a good way, especially gross profit percentage and inventory turnover. So we're gonna see when we look at Eddie's case that inventory turnover is a good number, gross profit is also a good figure. Uh, the effect of fictitious inventory on turnover, because once you have too much inventory, once you are claiming to have more inventory than you, than you have, your inventory turnover will slow down. It means you're not selling your inventory. Your cost of goods sold will 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 uh, will kind of be good, and your profit will look good, but your turnover is not is not good. And this is why would your profit be good and you're not selling? Okay, let's take a look actually at the crazy eddy. Basically, they were in the business of. Uh, uh, electronics sales so they used to sell TVs back in the 80s uh, not only TVs fans anything that's electronic stereos back in the 80s that was famous okay so those are the things they used to sell and this is their data for 86 uh, 85 86 and 87 okay so notice their sales was 136 thousand or million it doesn't matter 
Uh, this is their cost of goods sold. This is their gross profit. Their gross profit percentage in 85 was 24%. And their turnover in inventory was 5.2. So they were turning their inventory 5.2 times. Now in, in 86, their gross profit percentage went up a little, which is kind of could be normal because their, their sales went up. So it could be normal. But what's not normal is their inventory turnover start to slow down. Notice they used to turn over their inventory 5.2 times. Now their inventory inventory turnover slow down. It means they have they're starting to have too much inventory. And notice their inventory more than doubled. Okay, between 2000 between 85 and 86. Now if we go to to 87, notice their inventory went from 159 to 109. Their inventory doubled again. Oops, sorry. Their inventory doubled again to 109. And this is unusual. And what's happening is they're still making a profit, but they have too much inventory and their inventory turnover slowed down substantially. So now their inventory turnover was half of what, what it was two years ago. And this is a sign that the company is inflating ending inventory. Obviously, the, uh, uh, you know, Eddie Antar went to jail. He used to be called Crazy Eddie. Um, and obviously, he's out of jail. This is me. Obviously, this is me. And this is Crazy Eddie. Obviously, sorry, Crazy Eddie passed away this year, 2017, I believe, early in 2017. And this was in, in one of my co the colleges I work with, I work at in 2013 Student Awards. So he came, he had a meeting, he had a presentation, and um, we basically met. And I asked him a lot of questions about the case. And the purpose of his uh, presence was to, to present the fraud case that he was involved in. And there's actually a documentary about Crazy Eddie. And if you're interested, go ahead and uh, type Crazy Eddie on YouTube and you will see his crazy commercial. And that's why he's called Crazy Eddie for that purpose. So that's the inventory. And so Crazy Eddie is the picture that you, you need to keep in mind when we talk about uh, inventory, inventory uh, theft. Other specific fraud risk areas is purchasing and accounts payable fraud. Um, companies may del deliberately understate account payable and overstate income. As we saw in the Regina, in the Regina vacuum case, the, this, the president was hiding all the bills, the unpaid bills, because they don't want to show the payable. They don't want to show the record the expense. Okay, so this is how it happens. And again, we're going to look at accounts payable later on. Misappropriation in the acquisition and payment cycle. Uh, this is important. The most common or common 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 fraud the most common fraud in the acquisition area is the payment for to be issued to fictitious vendors or inflate the payment to real vendors so either you pay them more you pay the vendors more or so basically the purchasing agent will pay the vendor more this way the vendor will give them back some kickbacks from the money or they basically create fictitious vendors and they pay them basically pay their spouses their boyfriend girlfriend uh, relatives so on and so forth okay and deposit the cash in a fictitious account a case in point I, I like I chose for you is something close to where I live or what I'm technically from originally and this is November 30th 2016 former Ots potato chips executives gets present for 1.4 million fraud involving an Azred company so if you look at the case a former executive with the Pennsylvania Potato Chips and Snack Food Company will spend more than four years in federal prison for defrauding the company out of roughly 1.4 million. So the executive sold 1.4 million. Okay, so Kevin Mayers, 38, was sentenced to 51 months in prison Tuesday after acknowledging in July that he received 651,000 in kickbacks while purchasing director at Utz Quality Food in Hanover, York County. Federal prosecutor says Mayers received kickbacks from Jonathan Haas, which is, happens to be from my town where I lived for almost a decade of Eastern Pennsylvania, who owns Haas Packaging and Design. Okay, when the theft occurred between 2010 and 2014, Haas Packaging and Design was based at 300 Industrial Park Road. That's in Nazareth. I know exactly where that is. The company filed for bankruptcy in 2015. So notice what's happening. Haas pleaded guilty for submitting bogus invoices. So Haas would submit bogus invoices to Otz and the executive at Otz, Kevin, will pay those bogus invoices. So Otz was paying for stuff they did not really purchase. Okay. And what happened as a result, Kevin will get some money back from kickbacks, get 651,000 um, from, uh, from Otz. Now, specific other specific fraud areas is uh, we can have in fixed asset. What we could have a lot of fraud in fixed asset, but we're not going to talk about everything. But one of, of the fraud that occur, companies may capitalize repair to increase the amount of the asset. So when we spend money, when we spend money, rather than debiting an expense, 
and credit in cash on the fixed asset. Let's assume we repair the asset and we spend 100,000. 100,000, this, this is supposed to be expense. What the company would do, they will add it to the asset. So they will debit an asset and credit cash. This way, cap capitalizing expenditure. And this is what WordCom did. WordCom capitalized expenditure. Capitalizing means what? Capitalize means um, adding the expenditure to the asset. So whatever you spent, rather than debit and expense, you debit an asset. And by debiting an asset, it doesn't go on the income statement. It doesn't reduce your income now. It would, re it would reduce your income later when that asset is depreciated. Another example of uh, another uh, uh, fraud risk area is intangible asset. Those are actually high risk areas. The value of intangible, such as goodwill or asset impairment, if you have any, any, any intangible asset. What you need to do when you if you're familiar with intangibles or imp impairment of intangibles or impairment of goodwill, you need to estimate. Every, every time you hear the word estimate, there's a, there's a room for fraud. You need to estimate the cash flow of the asset. And who do the estimate of the cash flow? The company. So every time you have, you have estimates to make, the estimate could be susceptible to manipulation. So this is another high fraud risk area. Again, we'll talk about this later on when we looked at intangibles. Payroll expense, rarely an area of fraudulent financial reporting, okay, but usually it's a misappropriation of payments. So usually what happens is uh, somebody might add uh, a ghost employee to the payroll, or they may add their spouses or their uh, friends or their relatives, okay, so they will pay someone to overstate payroll. But also another area of payroll fraud when it comes to companies is when you pay, when you pay, you're supposed to debit either salary expense or let's assume you know 300,000 credit cash or payable 300,000. And sometimes what you have to do, those salaries expense, they go into inventory. So basically if you're manufacturing something, salary expense becomes part of your work in process, part of your inventory. So sometimes what you do is rather than expensing, you will treat your expenditure as an asset. So that's another area where, where, where fraud could happen. Uh, when it comes to salaries. Okay, so those are basically the basic areas. Uh, again, there's a lot, but this is just to give you a taste of uh, fraud. But uh, those topics, everything that you saw here, we're going to look at later from an auditing perspective. But to talk about fraud specifically about those areas, those are covered much, much more in details in a fraud course. Fraud is different than auditing. Um, the next topic we're going to look at is understand interview techniques and other activities after fraud is suspected. So what do we need to do once a fraud is suspected? We're going to look at some interview techniques, whatever they're worth. And I believe that will be the end of the um, uh, fraud series lecture. If you have any questions, any comments, by all means, email me or see me in class. If you're studying for your CPA exam, study hard. It's worth it.